Okay, we are pretty close to the end. We are about to do, whoops, sorry. We are about to do right here. Counting the cost, which is chapter nine. Hello everybody. And thanks for coming along for the ride. Okay. Um, I want to jump right into chapter nine here. Um, and Lewis, <clears throat> um, he gets into some stuff here that is so good. Um, and I know I've said that a lot, but it's true. And I understand why this book is so popular and why I believe God preserved it because um, Lewis had some pretty amazing insight. And uh, so um, I want to read, I'm going to read actually quite a long section of chapter 9 um, because I think Lewis really hits something here that's very powerful. And um, as I've said many times here, I've been a Christian for a long time. And there's a lot of bad theology out there, okay? Um, and I don't, claim, I don't claim any kind of perfection, okay? Um, but he who began a good work in me and you, if you're a Christian, what does the scripture say? He will carry it on to completion. And um, Lewis just nails this. He hits a he hits a uh, a uh, what do they call it a, a grand slam. He hits a grand slam. Okay. So I want to read this, and actually I think I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna actually do another video on this chapter, um, and I'm gonna keep it separate. But I'm gonna do two videos so that if you want more you can watch the second part of this video um, but I'm gonna cover chapter 9 in this one so that I can include that in the journey of mere Christianity here taking a fresh look at this so alright I'm gonna just read a big chunk of this because there's so much good stuff in here okay so the the title of the chapter as I said is counting the cost um, and that's you know that's that's a very fitting title um, that is why, speaking of Jesus, on page 202, your book may be different than mine, but that is why Jesus warned people to count the cost before becoming a Christian. Make no mistake. He says, if you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you are in for, nothing less or other than that. You have free will, and if you choose, you can push me away. Now this is Lewis talking for God. Okay? So this is C.S. Lewis basically speaking as if God were speaking. Okay? Um, but, if, but if you do not push me away, understand that I am going to see this job through. Whatever suffering it may cost you in this earthly life, whatever incon inconceivable purification it may cost you after death, whatever it costs me, I will never rest, nor let you rest, until you are literally perfect. Now, I'm just going to pause there because... Um, this is a very important um, and I'm gonna have to do another video because there's no way I can cover it in this chapter but Lewis remember what theology is okay theology is the study of God the science of God or the study of God I love the term the science of God um, and here's a little something that feel like God gave me personally which has helped me and will help me in the future and I believe it'll help you okay um, because God is no God is no respecter of persons what does that mean God is no respecter of persons that's kind of a 
That's the way the King James says, you know, a verse, I think it's in James, okay? It doesn't mean God doesn't respect people. That's not what that means. It means, basically it mean, means God has no favorites. God doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't show fa favoritism. Very different between God showing favor and God showing favoritism. Very, very different, okay? Favor is actually, the word grace is, um, I forget how you pronounce the word, but the word grace in the New Testament and the word favor in the New Testament are sometimes the same word. Okay, the same word. And Peter is crystal clear that the way you receive grace, okay, God gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. And both times in the New Testament when it mentions that, giving grace to the humble, it is always talking about believers. Okay? It's not talking about the unbelievers. It's talking about Christians. And does a Christian have to humble, does a, does a non-Christian have to humble themselves to receive grace? Of course they do. That's part of, that's part of what repentance means, is a willingness to change your mind, to, to recognize that we're all sinners, every single one of us, everybody. We, we're all, we all have fallen short of God's standard, everybody, okay? And the only thing that makes someone a Christian is the work of Christ. Okay? And I know Christians can be arrogant. I've met some really arrogant Christians. <laughs> okay? And that, and that, but, but they're not going to get grace in that area of their life where they're arrogant. Where you're proud and stubborn, where I'm proud or stubborn or arrogant, you will never get grace from God. Never. Until you humble yourself. Okay? You can be saved and still be arrogant. Okay? And I'm getting a tiny bit off the track, but this is so important. This, this, um, and I'm just going to say this because it's true, okay? Some of the best theology about the Godhead, we've already gone through that in the three personal God. But the best theology about um, being made perfect, and that, and, okay, that, there's so much confusion in the church about this. I'm just telling you, there's so much confusion, okay? You hear the statement, well, I'm never going to be perfect, okay? Um, all right, let me just keep going on this, but because Lewis talks about some of this in here, okay? And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm wound up about this, but this is so, this is so good, I can't even tell you. Like, this is the, some of the best theology I have ever heard related to uh, what it means to actually be perfect, okay? Perfect is not not a word that means without flaw or error. It actually, if you look up the, the Greek word that's used the most in the New Testament, it's the word teleo, and it means to bring something to completion, okay? If you build a house or whatever you build, anything you build or you make, when you start making that thing, you have in mind to complete that. Let's just use a house as an example. If you buy, if you built a house, you want to complete that house so you can live in it, enjoy and enjoy it. Okay, that's the picture and the word to Leo, which is translated perfect or maturity in the New Testament. It's not about this, you know, pie in the sky. I'm holier than thou and and without error. I mean, it does mean without error in the sense that God uh, makes us holy and works in our lives, and so that we. We not only don't do the wrong thing, but we do the right thing. We want to do the right thing, okay? So let me just get in here, because I'm, I'm going to start preaching here if I get on this. Okay. Um, okay, whatever it costs me, I will never rest, nor let you rest until you are literally perfect. Until my Father can say without reservation that he is well pleased with you. As he said... 
he was well pleased with me. Now again, this is Lewis talking for Jesus, okay? This I can do and will do, but I will not do anything less. And yet, this is the other and equally important side of it. This helper who will, in the long run, be satisfied with nothing less than absolute perfection. Now listen to this. This, this is so important right here. Okay. Will also be delighted with the first feeble, stumbling effort you make tomorrow to do the simplest duty. Let me read that again. This helper who will in the long run be satisfied with nothing less than absolute perfection will also be delighted with the first feeble stumbling effort you make tomorrow to do the simplest duty. As a great Christian writer, uh, George MacDonald, pointed out, every father is pleased at the baby's first attempt to walk. No father will be satisfied with anything less than a firm, free, manly walk in a grown-up son. Did you catch that? Here's the picture. Any, any person who's had a child knows the joy and the love that they have of that child. And when that child takes its first step, that, that father is overjoyed. And, but that father knows that the ultimate goal, if you will, of him being a parent is that this child grow and become a man. Okay? That is what, that's what the New Testament teaches about maturing and growing. Okay? Let me just say this thing and I'm, then I'm going to move on. Okay? As a Christian... If you are the same today as you were a year ago, something is drastically wrong in your relationship with God. And, and I hope that doesn't offend you, but if it does, I'm sorry, it's true. God is all about growth. Look at anything that God created, and it grows. And as Christians... Let me just say it this way. As a Christian, it is God's desire that you continually grow in grace, in faith, in love, in compassion. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. The whole chapter talks about virtues that Peter says, if you grow in these virtues, you will be fruitful and you'll have a rich reward when you enter heaven. I don't have time to get into that, but I'm going to do that in the, in the other video connected to this. So let me finish this thought here, okay? In the same way he said, God is easy to please, but hard to satisfy. God is easy to please. If after watching this video, you know that there's something in you that you need to deal with with God, and you go before God and you deal with that, that is pleasing to God. If there's an area in your life that you know God has been causing you to take a step of faith, and you haven't taken that step of faith. If you go right now, if you go right now and you take that step of faith, God is pleased. Okay? But He's not satisfied until He makes us everything that He intends us to be. The practical upshot of this, on the one hand, God's demand for perfection need not discourage you in the least in your present attempt to be good. Or even in your personal, in your present failures. Each time you fail, He will pick you up again. And He knows perfectly well that your own efforts are never going to bring you anywhere near perfection. Now that's important. Your own effort will never bring you nearer to perfection. He who began the good work within you will carry it on if we cooperate okay if you cooperate 
God is not going to violate your will. And I don't want to offend anybody, but God is not a Calvinist. God is not Calvinistic. Okay? God is not going to going to force his will in your life. He's not going to do it. You can resist God in what he wants to do in your life. Okay? This this whole notion God's will is going to be done regardless is it's not true, okay? It's bad theology. It's one side of a of an issue and it's not it's not true. Okay? Um anyways, I need to get off my my thing here. Okay. Um <clears throat> On the other hand, you must realize from the outset that the goal toward which he is beginning to guide you is absolute perfection. And no power in the universe except yourself can prevent him from taking you to that goal. I want you to think, I would urge you to think about that. I would urge you to think about that. Romans 12, 2 in the New Living Translation says this, Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And I'm going to say this here, okay? You know, Martin Luther King, not, not, uh, or not, not King, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther, the reformer, the one who, you know, um, started the Protestant Revolution, or Protestant Reformation, I'm sorry. He wrote 95 theses that he, that he posted, that he, that he nailed on the, the door in Wittenberg, in the, in the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, I believe it was. The first of the 95 theses, this is what it was. You may not know this, but I encourage you to take this to heart, Okay. The first of the 95 theses was this. Repentance is the life, L-I-F-E, of a Christian. I want you to think about that for just a second. Repentance is the life of the Christian. That was the first of Martin Luther's 95 theses that got him in such trouble with the Catholic Church. What does that mean? Here's really simply what it means. And I'm going to do more of this in the, in the adjacent video to this. Okay. Here's what it boils down to. Where you're unwilling to think differently, okay, which is what repentance means. Repentance means a change of mind that leads you to a change of life. Okay. So wherever you're, wherever I or you are unwilling to think differently, we are unrepentant as Christians. As Christians. Both Jesus Christ himself and John the Baptist both came preaching, repent, change your thinking, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, there may be a lot of reasons why they said, I mean, they did it because that's what the Holy Spirit led them to do, okay? But here they came to Israel. They came to the nation of Israel. And Israel missed the coming of Messiah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move on here, but I'm telling you, what does it mean to have your mind renewed? The New Testament talks about renewing your mind. What does that mean? Does that just happen once in a while? Is that something that happened when you got saved and then it doesn't happen anymore? No. Romans 1, Romans 12, 1 or 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And where you're unwilling to change your thinking, God cannot renew your mind the way He wants to, and you will not be changed. Okay? God has the power to change in us what He needs and wants to change. The question really is, am I willing? 
It's not whether God can do it. It's whether I'm willing. So you have to ask yourself that question. Are there areas of your life that are unrepentant? And listen, this one is really simple and clear. If, if you have active sin in your life, I'm telling you as a brother who loves you, okay? I'm telling you out of love as a brother who loves you. I'm telling you it's because you're unrepentant. Okay? Because if you would be willing to repent, God will empower you. He'll, he'll turn you away from that behavior. But he does it from the inside out. God is much more concerned about what's going on in our heart than he is our behavior. Does he care about our behavior? Absolutely he does. But God is deeper than that. God knows why you do what you do and why I do what I do. He knows it. That's why he wants to transform us from the inside out. Okay. That is what you are in for. And it is very important to realize that if you do not, then we are very likely to start pulling back and resisting him after a certain point. I think that many of us, when Christ has enabled us to overcome one or two sins that were an obvious nuisance, are inclined to feel, though we do not put it into words, that we are now good enough. He has done all we wanted him to do, and we should be obliged if he would now leave us alone. As we say, I never expected to be a saint. I only wanted to be a decent, ordinary chap. And we imagine when we say this that we are being humble. But this is the fatal mistake. Of course we never wanted and never asked to be made this sort of creature he is going to make us into. But the question is not what we intended ourselves to be, but what he intended us to be when he made us. He is the inventor, we are only the machine. He is the painter, we are only the picture. How should we know what he wants us to be like? You see, he has already made us something very different from what we were. I could read this whole chapter, but I'm going to I'm going to wind this down, okay? Here is an Oh, oh, yeah, here, let me end with this. He has plans for us and was determined to carry them out. Something the same is now happening at a higher level. We may be content to remain what we call ordinary people, but he is determined to carry out a quite different plan. To shrink back from that plan is not humility. It is laziness and cowardice. To submit to it is not conceit or megalomania, it is obedience. I'm going to read that again. Because some of you, some of you had what I had, which is called false humility. Okay? What is false humility? False humility, first of all, is usually self centered. Okay? Oh, I'm, you put yourself down. If you put yourself down a lot, you have false humility. Okay, And the root of false humility is actually the same thing as pride. It's just the flip side of the same coin. What am I talking about? False humility is, is, is a focus. You're still focused on yourself. Okay, Here's the way I say it. 
to think less of yourself than God does is not humility, it's false humility. Let me say that again. To think less of yourself than God does is not is not humility, it's false humility. And so I invite you to consider if that's part of the way you see yourself. Let me read this again and then I'll end this, okay? So he's talking about Christ and if you read if you read Romans 8:29, the will of God is to make you like Jesus and he has the power to do it. He has the power to do it. We may, we may be content to remain what we call ordinary people, but he is determined to carry out a quite different plan. To shrink back from that plan is not humility. It is laziness and cowardice. To, to submit to it is not conceit or megalomania. It is obedience. It is obedience. To submit to God is obedience. And there's a lot more I could say. And again, I'm going to do, I'm going to end this video right here for mere Christianity. And then I'm going to do another video related to this topic. Um, so thank you. I know that was long, but that, that is such an important chapter. It's such an important chapter. Listen, for those of you who think, who don't think about yourself the way God does, I invite you to open your heart. I really do. I open your heart to how God sees you and what Christ can do in you, what God can do in you. And if you have, if you have sinful patterns in your life that you have not been able to change, I urge you, I urge you as a brother, to submit those things afresh to God. I don't care how long you failed. I don't care how many times you failed. Christ can never fail. And if you will be willing to repent and think differently, and really the greatest thing that changed my life and set me free from sinful things that I could not overcome was, was studying the Scripture, what it really says. Because the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit. It does surgery internally on you between your flesh and your spirit. And if you're willing to count the cost, okay, because there is a cost, okay, there is a cost to following Jesus, okay. You know, I heard it said, a lot when I was young. Jesus died on the cross so you wouldn't have to. Okay? That's only half of the truth. Okay? Jesus died on the physical tr cross because we could not pay for our own sins. But Jesus commanded us to pick up our own cross and follow him. As a matter of fact, he said if we don't pick that cross up, we cannot follow him. And I'm done here, okay? I'm, I'm done. But think about this, my dear, my dear brother or sister, okay? Why is it that we can't follow Jesus if we don't pick up our cross? The reason is very simple. Because you're still in control of your life. You're still in control of your life. Corinthians, I just read it this morning. Paul rebuked the Corinthians because they were controlled by their sinful nature. And all of us to some degree are probably controlled, to our, controlled by our sinful nature. It's not an instantaneous thing. But I leave you with this. If you have an area where you know you're controlled by your sinful nature, I urge you to take, I urge you to read this chapter until this truth gets in your heart and study the scripture for yourself be like a Berean and study the scripture yourself and I'm telling you from my own testimony God will set you free
of whatever besetting sin you may have. I, I just throw that out to you. I invite you to do it. He whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. We are to be set free from sin. Doesn't mean we won't make mistakes or fail. But I'm talking about ongoing, consistent, sinful behavior in an area. Be willing to repent, think differently, and let the Holy Spirit give you victory. All right, thank you for watching this. I know it was long. And I'm going to do another video about this because this is so important. Uh, the, the church really needs to understand this whole thing about perfection and growing and becoming like Christ. So thank you so much. God bless you for hanging in here and watching this whole video. And be encouraged. Don't give up, man. Don't give up. Become The army had the slogan, be all you can be. If the army had that slogan, shouldn't we have that so much more? For our God, for the one who died for us, be all you can be in him. I love you. God bless you.